Thank you for joining us for this Ask Alumni Live Career Conversation as part of the Alumni Career Compass Program from the University of Melbourne. The Career Compass Program aims to demonstrate some of the benefits of the university's alumni community by giving recent graduates access to alumni to share insights and advice based on their career journeys. My name is Triada Papadimitriou. I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Melbourne Law School, and it is my pleasure to be joined online today by law alumna Madeline Miller. Hi, Madeline. Hi. Madeline completed a Bachelor of Arts in 2002 and her honours in Criminology in 2005, worked overseas several years in a variety of jobs, including a short period in film production and as tour manager throughout Europe. She then obtained her JD from Melbourne Law School in 2008 and completed a traineeship in media law at Trescox Lawyers in Melbourne. She worked as a solicitor, production attorney and legal counsel in Melbourne after a side foray in Cambodia, interning at the United Nations War Crimes Tribunal and teaching contract law and international humanitarian law at the Royal University of Law and Economics in Phnom Penh. Four years ago, Madeline undertook a Master's of Entertainment Law at UCLA in Los Angeles and has since worked in a range of legal and business affairs roles in the entertainment industry in LA. She is currently Senior Business Affairs Executive at Eon Productions, the makers of the James Bond franchise. So thank you for joining us today, Madeline. You're welcome. I've got some questions that I'm going to run through. Firstly, can you briefly describe your career journey and your current role? Sure. I mean, you gave a lot of the sort of big points then, but when I graduated law school, I kind of was torn between what I wanted to do. I did the JD before, right before it became the Melbourne model. So it was a two year program and it was pretty much geared around corporate law. Um, I didn't really have any corporate experience. No one in my family has corporate experience, but I felt like that was kind of what I should do. And so I sort of was toying with this idea of maybe doing another degree in international law, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, no, I really should just go and get a job. So I thought if I really was going to get a job in corporate law, like what's the most interesting thing to me? And I'd always been interested in the film industry. You know, I'd wanted to sort of be a producer or a writer. And I thought that, you know, entertainment law was the best sort of solution of combining the two. And also I was attracted to knowing more about the business of the entertainment industry. So in Melbourne, there weren't a lot of options sort of directly out of law school to do that kind of work. Therese Cox offered a pretty good practice, um, but it really turned out to be in Melbourne, at least it was more in media law. It wasn't so much an entertainment law. I think their Sydney practice is a bit more entertainment law focused, which you find actually in Australia, like a lot of the works in Sydney, if it's strictly entertainment, a lot of the work in Melbourne is a bit more media based. So I did that and I got to work because my partner at the time, like my, my the law partner was, um, he was the like counsel for that show. I think it's still on TV. So I've been out of Australia for four years now, but, uh, the project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's still on. Yeah. Okay. So we sort of did a lot of advice work there and have to um, provide advice on every nightly show. And that was really, that was interesting. I mean, that was a lot of clearance, privacy, defamation, that kind of stuff. But at least I was sort of behind the scenes at a TV program. I got to see how that was being made. But then I had a bit of a crisis and thought, no, I really want to be doing international law. So I had already visited Cambodia in the War Crimes Tribunal because there's an Australian judge there. And I set up a meeting before via my international law teacher at Melbourne University, Tim McCormick. He's a really prominent international criminal lawyer. And so via him, I'd been introduced to the Australian judge in Cambodia. So all of that is to say that I already had a sort of like relationship with that judge. And when I applied for the internship at the United Nations, I got in and then I went to Cambodia and spent a year there. And I did six months, you know, at the War Crimes Tribunal, which was amazing. And then I stayed longer. The U UN has this thing where you can't get a job after interning for six months. So I sort of hung around and that's why I started teaching law at university, which again was just something that fell in my lap. I wasn't particularly qualified to do. And, um, but then I realized that the international criminal law world was really shrinking and there were a lot of really qualified people, more qualified than me, that would soon be fighting for jobs all back in the Hague. So I realised that that wasn't really where I saw my career going. So I came back to Australia and then I really just needed a job. Um, and I kind of still wanted to do entertainment law, but there was no position where I'd been. So a partner at my old law firm had said, 
had gone to the Victorian government solicitor's office. So she got me a job working on a big class action. And I think that was actually where my real training as a lawyer began. It was a really, the class action was interesting enough. It was a large negligence case, but sort of through VGSO, I managed to work, you know, in-house in a commercial role for, uh, you know, government one of the government agencies dealing with infringements, like traffic infringements. It sounds really dull, but it was really interesting because it was like large tenders and things like that. And then I also managed to do more intellectual property work because I thought, no, I really want to, do this entertainment law thing properly. So I started to sort of stack up my experience and my resume to get me the profile that I should have if I was an entertainment lawyer. So, you know, from international law to public law to sort of commercial public law to intellectual property. And then finally, and I volunteered for the Human Rights Film Festival as like their legal counsel. Um, and then I eventually got a job at Screen Australia in Melbourne, which is a much smaller office. And if, for those that don't know, it's the financing arm of the federal government for the film and TV industry. So then I was really working in Australia as what, you know, what an Australian entertainment lawyer is. Like I was managing the financing and the investments of the Australian government into the film industry. And after a couple of years of that, I realised that I felt unless I wanted to go back into a firm, which I didn't really want to. Like I felt that my experience was going to be capped in Australia. Um, there was only so much work I could do. Um, and there was only, again, so many people to do the work and they're all pretty experienced. And so I bit the bullet and applied for master's programs in the United States, which I was always terrified about doing because I cost so much money. But I applied for a bunch and then you know, there were a few offers and I didn't really know where I was going to go. But in the day I picked UCLA because they gave me a good scholarship so I could afford it. And also they had a really um, specialised entertainment law program. So I thought, well, at this age, by this stage I was, you know, I was like 34 or something. And I thought, well, at this age, like I need to come out of this degree and this financial investment with, with what looks like a clear job path. And so I, I did that. And then I knew that after the uh, master's program you had a year to work in the states without having to worry about an additional visa so that was really my goal I hustled really hard during that year at UCLA to make connections I did a lot of you know free um, internships and did whatever I could took coffees with whoever I could uh, so I could try and get a job at the end and then sort of almost like no it didn't happen like that but it was like when it happened, it happened like that. I just suddenly one day got a job and since there I've just moved and, you know, whatever, and now I've ended up at Eon Productions. But that's the kind of, that's the background as to how I got here like a couple of years ago. And here, by here I mean LA, yeah. Great, thank you. So you've, you've mentioned that you've worked in Australia, you've worked in Cambodia, and now you're in the US in LA. How has working internationally influenced your career? I think for me, the work I do is, that's why I'm business affairs now, like it's still legally based, but it's a real crossover into the commercial side of, well, in this case, the film industry. And so I think it doesn't really matter after you've done your law degree and had some experience where if you work in a common law jurisdiction, which I do, I think having worked in Australia and then having worked even in Cambodia in a different type of law but with different people from different backgrounds, like I had a French boss and um, an Australian boss and then there were um, local Cambodian staff, I think you become equipped at dealing with like cross-cultural communication. So I think when I came to America, like it was getting used to the American way, which is different to the Australian way. I'm, I, can, I mean, I can go into that a bit later as to how it's different. And then I went to London for nine months for this particular film I'm working on, which is the new James Bond film. And again, I lived in London when I was much, much younger, but, you know, and the English are a little bit more like the Australians, but then it was like readjusting to the English way. And it was funny because there were certain things I did that I, like somebody told me it was a little bit confronting to the English people and I realised that it was a very American way and I just sort of adapted that. It was completely normal in America but I had to sort of readjust again. So I think now it's almost like you sit above and you see the Australian way, the American way, the UK way, you know, the international way and I think you just, I think working internationally you just become very good at sort of your tonal changes depending on who you're dealing with. Great. What would you say are the most important first steps for recent graduates? 
Especially there's a in law school. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there's a law graduate. Right? Um, first steps, you know, in getting a job or when, once you have a job, like how do you mean? So the graduates, our graduates who have finished in their, their first 10 years, but we'll say like say out of three years out of university, like what steps do you think they should be taking? Yeah, people told me this a lot when I finished and I didn't want to hear it but I think it's probably true I think it's good to get a solid legal training I think that you might not enjoy it and you might wonder where your life is going um, and you might feel it's not authentic to who you want to be but I think if you've gone that far and you don't have to like you don't have to practice as a lawyer you don't have to take the bar if you're over here and you don't have to get admitted in Australia you know, if you're uncertain, it's worth doing all of those things and having, you know, at least two years, maybe three training as a lawyer, because that really sets you up to do a lot of other things. It also gives you a certain expertise, even though you may not be super advanced, you have a particular expertise that other people don't because law is people, you can't be a lawyer unless you've gone to law school. I mean, it's not, it's not the same exactly as being a doctor, but it's not like, and in England, I know they do generalist degrees and they convert into law, but there is something that's sort of like bespoke and professionalised about being a lawyer. So I feel like if you can put in a couple of years to be a qualified lawyer, it almost gives you a bit of um, job insurance. Like it actually can really help you moving forward. It gives you a bit of freedom. And if you're uncertain about what you want to do, a couple of years is okay because you haven't quite hit that peak where you feel like you can't do anything else. And you also haven't hit the peak financially where you think you'll never get paid the same. You couldn't tell from your bio if you had um, passed the bar in California. Did you do that or you're not practicing? No, I don't. I don't have the Californian bar. And I think that's another thing that I think if you just came to America and you wanted to work as a lawyer, you would need to sit the bar. You would need to know who you were. I think that having studied here for a year and then interned at a number of places and also having a few good years, this is, I think, going to my earlier point, having a few good years as a lawyer, like just being just at the point where I felt like, okay, I kind of am an okay lawyer. I didn't think I was a very good lawyer, but I knew enough. I think having that experience and getting the first job, like once you have it, you don't really need the bar. That's not the same, of course, if you want to go to a law firm, you do need the bar for the law firm. Yeah, but to do legal and business affairs in-house, you don't really need it. On to our next question. So what mistakes should people try to avoid in the early stages of their careers? I saw that question and I, I was wondering how I would answer it. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I really... I mean, I think my response is a little bit philosophical. I don't really think you should view things as mistakes. I mean, I've, if I was to criticise myself, I think I've always sort of catastrophize the fact that I wasn't necessarily doing exactly what I wanted and really beat myself up about it. And so maybe if I look back with hindsight, like trust the path, trust that even if you're not exactly doing what you want to do now, don't think that you won't get somewhere where you want to get. Like I think that we can sort of feel like this is it and I'm never going to be able to shift from this. I don't think that's true. I think you can get that. And I still have to tell myself that, like that's an ongoing process, but yeah, I think don't feel like you don't have options because you do. Yeah, and they say, and you might, having spent some time in LA now, like I hear that Americans have a better philosophy about failures and learning from failures, especially like in the startup world, whereas I think in Australia... Oh, possibly, yeah. ...ourselves about, you know, failures, like you're not yeah. somebody in the startup world unless you've failed at a startup. Yeah, that's probably true. I haven't really spent much time in that whole tech space, so I don't really know much about that mentality. But Americans do have, whether it's an outward notion of, you know, accepting failure, because it's a pretty competitive society, they they do brush it under the carpet more. It's almost like that saving face and, like, putting, like always having to sort of be assertive and confident and strong. They're a lot less self-deprecating than Australians. It's true. And so I think... Yeah, I think in some ways that is a positive because they don't, I think they just repress failure, <laughs> just like plow forward. And I think maybe Australians get a bit, oh, me too, like get a bit stuck on, I don't have this, I can't do that, that will never work, I, you know, that, that's impossible. And I think in America that attitude, yeah, that attitude's not here. That's different. 
what advice would you give to somebody looking to succeed in your film of work? So being in the entertainment industry or being in LA, like you already mentioned, take every coffee that you can and, and yeah. hustle as much as you can. Do you have yeah. any advice? Networking is important. And networking, had, when I was growing up, I thought the word networking had such terrible connotations. I think it sort of conjures up this old school, like, fake, you know, champagne sipping, I don't know, flake. But it's not like that at all. Networking is like sometimes it's an authentic connection, sometimes it's just meeting somebody. I found that every job I've gotten has been via either somebody referring me or somebody even just saying, oh, there's an Australian girl that this or this person did. Like nothing has really just been cold out of the blue. And it's not even that I was necessarily the most qualified or the most, definitely not the most experienced. I've never been the most experienced in anything I do. But I think that if you're persistent and you stick around and you have to develop a bit of a tough skin, but you also just, I think I used to think like if I did one thing, that would be the thing. And if that didn't become the thing, then I'd failed. Now I just have a much more pragmatic approach that I can meet 20 people and of those 20 people, something might happen eventually. And to me, that's success. So how do you continue to build your network? Just like I said, I just, it's very normal here to just maintain relationships with people. Very, very normal. I don't know if it's strictly the legal world or the entertainment world or the, I mean, it's very common in the entertainment world because it's all based on relationships. So I think that kind of merge of where like, legal business and law comes into it but you meet people for lunch you have coffees with people you go to work events networking it's very normal to ask someone to meet you for lunch so you just do that a lot well you can come to alumni events <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's also true what advice would you give to graduates looking to work overseas and if you want to focus particularly in the US or in LA or even in Cambodia, like you actually, you've quite worldly. So <laughs> had a few experiences. What advice do I give them? Yeah. So oh. I think we have a lot of our, a few of our JD students who come through and yeah. our master's students, they would want to take the qualification overseas once they finish and to get a job. And about half of our alumni do work outside of Melbourne. And so what advice would you have for them? I think further education in another jurisdiction is a good way to get a foot in the door. That's not always possible. Like we can't all just be keeping to do degrees. But for Cambodia, again, it was kind of relationship-based. I mean, if you know that you like a particular area of law, my advice would be to speak to teachers and academics like at the law school in that area and see who they can recommend in different jurisdictions and areas and see if they can make you an introduction. Um, I think that's actually a very good way. Of, that's how I got all my first breaks, all of them. So, yeah, like use the networks you have, which are probably your networks from law school if you're a recent graduate. And don't be afraid to speak. If you are working as a lawyer, if you're working at a firm or in house, don't be afraid to speak to other people there and ask them what they've done and what people they know if there's an area. Like, I, think, I think you just have to be really assertive about your career. You can be nice about it, but I think you need to ask the questions and see if people will introduce you to people in an area that you're interested in and that might be overseas and if you want to build up your expertise in a particular area to show you know so you can go overseas and say i have a, you know profile in this space volunteer i mean i volunteered with the film festival it wasn't an enormous amount of work but it really looked like on paper i had this strong vision for who i wanted to be as a lawyer even if i didn't feel like i was actually that person like i looked like that person on paper so that transfer very well when I did go to another country because I yeah this is the experience I have this is what I've done like they don't really know what it means because it's Australia you know it's not the same it's not their country but it looks like you have some you know dedication and devotion to your particular sure. area yeah what are your top three tips for making it <laughs> what's making it <laughs> <laughs> well you know being in an industry that you're in or being in a job that, you know, you enjoy, work-life balance. Maybe we can decide what making it means. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, being able to leave the office at five. Talk to people because people will tell you about what else is out there in the world. And sometimes it's hard to know. Like before I came to the States, I didn't know there was this thing called business affairs. 
I didn't know that there was a distinction between legal and business affairs. And it's a particularly, you know, it's a uniquely Hollywood thing. Business affairs does a lot of the negotiations, which is what I wanted to do, but I didn't even know how to articulate that because I didn't know it existed. So asking a lot of questions, meeting people and having them tell you how something exists is an important way of understanding all the options you might have. I mean, that's one thing. But the other thing I would say, almost maybe in opposition to that, is don't let people tell you how it is. Like, don't let people put limits on what role you can have or how things are going to work. You, can, you actually can, and it takes some time, but you can start to create the work life you want. Um, for me, and I don't, this isn't everybody's thing, but for me, I took a lot of risks. I took financial risks. I think I, you know, I acted with some courage. I stepped sometimes without a safety net and I really didn't have a safety net. I mean, I didn't really have that much money myself. In fact, I was in debt for a while. So like I would take calculated risks. All of my risks well, were like, kind of calculated risks. I mean, you a degree from Melbourne Law School, a degree like your, your undergrad and then going to UCLA, they're all very credible institutions. Yeah. But even like, going to UCLA, I didn't know if the, at the end I'd get a job but I just sort of trusted that something would work out and I worked hard to make that happen. But, you know, like people said, they, everyone said it's so hard to get a job. Oh, it's so hard to get a job without the bar. It's impossible to get a job without the bar. You know, and it's, it's kind of true. Like of my intake at UCLA, the foreign students, I think I'm, I think I'm the only one that's here with a job or one of a couple, but I came with some experience. English was my first language. I'd all, I, you know, I came with the goal to get into entertainment law and I sort of had it all planned. So, like, I was strategic about it, you know. Mm. So take risks, take calculated risks. And the reason I got this James Bond gig was I said, yep, I'll move to London, whatever, I'll work it out, I'll go for six months. I, like, had to work out my apartment. I had to quit my job. Um, I had to go to London. I had to try, you know, like I did that. But now I have this amazing opportunity where I'm back in LA. I get to work from my house. I'm still on this, like, you know, one of the biggest films ever made and I'm doing all this new work. And that would never have happened if I hadn't have just said, I'll go. So yeah, calculated risks. Are you able to tell us what you did on the James Bond film? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm still doing it. I went there and I was just going to help out. And so, but I found out on like the second day that my role and my title was production attorney. So I was actually the production attorney on the film, which was suddenly a whole new area of things and law that I'd never done. So, so I thought I was going to be doing more business affairs stuff like negotiating like talent agreements, doing director's deals, whatever. But that was kind of done. And also some of them are so big that they use a law firm specifically for that. What I actually ended up doing a lot of was um, when we went into production. So you have like the pre-production period and then you have production, which is when principal photography starts. So around that period, I suddenly was doing all of our location agreements. I was doing all of our operations agreements. I was reading like charter agreements for helicopters. Then I started doing all of our promotions and partnership agreements. When the sort of the main principal photography ended and sort of the period we're in now, which is like the pre-publicity period because the film's coming out next year. Now I manage all of the partnership agreements. So, you know, James Bond has some famous partnerships, Omega, Aston Martin, Jaguar Land Rover, et cetera, et cetera. I work with our marketing publicity team and we negotiate the placement if they're doing a placement in the film, the promotional campaign. Uh, I do all of the licensing and merchandising agreement for the James Bond IP. So yeah, now I'm like in a completely different space. So I was the production attorney, I'm business affairs, but just it's all encompassing. <laughs> wow. And um, you feel like your law degrees help set you up for that, to have the skills? Yeah, I think, I mean... For this work? It, I think, um, I think I was saying this to you guys earlier before we started, I think being Australian and having studied in an Australian law school and particularly Melbourne Uni, because I mean, it is such a high established law school that is so prestigious. I think the quality of teaching and the, and the training you get is really, really exceptional. And I don't think you really realise that until you leave Australia, like how well-educated we actually are and I think it's the way we think is quite pragmatic it's not necessarily as argumentative but it's quite um well yeah I mean, pragmatic is the word I always use so I think that having been trained to think that way 
I think that's when I had to sort of do all of these different things. I didn't freak out about what I didn't know. I just sort of took a step back and applied a pragmatic framework to whatever the deal might be. So the context mattered less than an assessment of what was going on. And I think that that training, I think there's a uniquely Australian approach in that, but I also think that now I realise like what an Australian education really gives you. And I think it's a like the law school in particular, but also my undergrad at Melbourne Uni, it, te- it teaches you a really good critical analysis, um, which I think is is quite unique. Yeah. Great. So what is the best professional advice that you have ever received from either a mentor or a former manager or a colleague or friend? This isn't mm-hmm. professional advice, but this is something I think about all the time and I think about it it's really got nothing to do with my like with professions per se, but it actually applies to every deal I do. People get very like, this is it or this isn't it. And, you know, everyone gets very definitive and very emotional about things. And I've always applied this. There's this expression that one of the, he was a lawyer in Cambodia. He was an English guy. He's a barrister. And he said something to me once. Yeah, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip, which means that, you know, you think you have this and you think you have this and they're meant to come together, but before that actually happens, so much can go wrong. Like just don't count your chickens. I guess it's like don't count your chickens before they're hatched. And for some reason that comes to me all the time in my workplace environment. I think that is fu- that forms part of the pragmatism. Like, mm. like I think we get too attached to outcomes in our career, in, you know, in our daily lives, you know, in our relationships. And I think that, for some reason that's really stuck with me and it's helped me just take a much more prosaic kind of like step-by-step approach to things. Okay, great. So I might go into um, some of the submitted questions that we received from people before signing up to that when they signed up to the podcast. Um, So this one comes from Julian and what is the best way to get your foot in the door in the entertainment industry? I mean, if, you, if you're meeting as a lawyer and you're in Australia and if you're in Melbourne, I think probably, uh, I mean, depending what you want to do, but at the end of the day, a lot of it's commercial law, it's a lot of it's contracts law. Um, so, like I said, getting a couple of years good experience somewhere in that sort of area really helps. And then if you can't be working directly in entertainment law, I think building up your CV, like I said, the volunteer experience or to show that you're actually interested in the, in the space is really useful. If you want to be more on the kind of production creative side, which is where I'm kind of heading, like I did a night degree at BCA, which um, really helped show me like a different side. Uh, so it's, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure like by industry. Like BCA. Huh? You say you did a light degree as well, like and not like a, a, an evening an evening degree. It's like one year. Yeah. Oh, night. Night, <laughs> night. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to ask you before going back to our submitted questions. I'll just ask you this question as well. Yeah. Um, what is the one piece of advice you would give to your younger self when facing career hurdles? Don't take it personally and trust, yeah. Trust the path? Trust the path. Don't overreact and take things personally. We're only overreacting because we feel like we're going to be, um, like we're being not respected and we're going to be revealed as some imposter. But that doesn't happen. You just, you know what you know and you get better. <laughs> yeah, good one. And um, this one comes through from Catherine and she's asked, not wanting to be a lawyer, can you still get the legal training to act as a springboard to get into the entertainment industry without taking the bar and being a practising lawyer? Again, it depends what they want to do in the entertainment industry. I think a legal career sets you up really well for a variety of roles. And if you're determined not to be a lawyer and you've got a law degree, I think that doesn't help. I think that only helps you to get into the industry. Again, like if you meet in Australia, if you meet in the US, if you've been creatively, if you've been in production, I think a law degree has now become like one of the best base degrees to have for any career. Like I said before, it really teaches you a way of critical thinking. You don't have to sit the bar and become a lawyer. Not everybody wants to go work in contracts for a few years, but depending on what you want to do, 
I think if you're if you're a recent graduate with a law degree and you know you don't want to be a lawyer and you therefore you know are going to get an entry level job somewhere as a production assistant, production runner, um, I think you just need to emphasize that how much the skills a law degree gives you. So it's like clear communication, concise thinking, critical reasoning abilities. I think if that's the position you're in, if you're a recent grad and you've got that degree and you want your first job, you should really draw heavily on the skills your law degree gave you because I think they're really good for employers. Thank you. And this one's from Michelle. What are the challenges and opportunities in practising law in the entertainment industry? Uh, I mean, the opportunities might be endless. Uh, The challenges, there are a lot of challenges. I think that it's bespoke so it's hard to start off in straight away you have to sort of push a bit especially in Australia because it's a small industry it's quite competitive in that way um in the United States there's more job that's that's true Uh, again there's a difference between working in a firm or working in a production company or a financier like I did The challenges are that sometimes, especially in Hollywood, I feel like it's the worst of both worlds because, you know, lawyers can be, especially in the States, can be pretty adversarial and they can be pretty aggressive or egotistical and then the entertainment industry is filled with narcissists. So sometimes you put the two together and it's like the hardest people to deal with. But sometimes it's so ridiculous that it makes it easy because you just like, these people are so like beyond like what I, you know, what I need to accept as normal that like it's easier to manage them. The more crazy they are, the almost the easier it is yeah. to manage. You take things less personally then, hey, and you're able to just work. Yeah. 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 And also the other thing I would say, nobody really knows anything. I feel like the, the game of law is a lot of, especially here, and I, I've been out of practice in Australia for so long, I can't say for sure, but here in particular in the entertainment, entertainment, it's just a lot of bluster. It's a lot of like bravado and like this is how things are. And this is how they, things change all the time just because things are a particular way. Like it doesn't really mean it has to be done that way. It's a whole set of made up rules and made up language and made up practices that are just there because they're there. So I wouldn't get oh. overwhelmed or intimidated by what everybody's telling you is the way things are done. There's actually better ways to do things. Do you think that's, that's a result of being in a common law system? Like, do you think it would be different under a civil law system? I don't really That's have enough experience with civil law to know how it might be different. I think I think it's the culture of the industry that's growing around the legal practice. It's very much, I mean, it's legal. And again, I'm not a litigator, like, and I'm not in a firm. But when you close film deals and when you deal with talent and when you do bonds, like, like in completion bonds to ensure that, you know, you do financing. I mean, financing has a set of rules. That's probably a little bit more structured. But a lot of it is just, especially business affairs, it's a lot of like here are the, here are the informal rules and customs that have grown around this industry and everybody just plays by them. And I just feel like it's just, it is like a made up language and you just have to learn the language. And once you learn the language, it's not that hard. But when you first come, it's so foreign and so confusing. And I don't know whether that's to do with common law or just how you just, you know, how cultures grow up around particular industries. I mean, it's fun too. You get to do really cool things like fly to Jamaica. Sounds great. So this is a question from Sean. I'm thinking of starting my career in an Australian media regulation agency. Is working in-house in this way sufficient legal training? And is there a way to shift around from there? Or is it always best to gain experience in private practice? I don't think it's, no, I don't think you need to always get experience in private practice. I mean, it depends where you want to go and the kind of work you want to do. But regulatory agencies in Australia are really good um they're really prestigious and high quality kind of work with really good Mm. lawyers so i think that you can get really good legal training again if you strictly want to move into something and they're like can you draft contracts i mean you probably can you can probably interpret legislation and draft contracts by doing that so no i don't think you have i think it's so hard to get a job in a regulatory agency in australia that if you've got that you should you should stick with that and be proud. I don't think you need to work in the firm necessarily. Thank you. I'll submit a question from Coco, which you've already alluded to a little bit. 
but how did you find shifting between Australian, US and UK legal system? So you touched on the cultural difference. Yeah, legal so the legal part itself, I didn't find it that hard. And I think it's because they've been practising for a while and I mainly do contracts. Really, the bulk of my work, you know, outside of the negotiations and the discussions and, you know, it affected, like I do contracts. So it's not it's not that different i mean there's things like the legal spelling and there are certain things that especially around insurance that i've realized sort of have jurisdictional differences and there's certain things around indemnity and but at the end of the day a contract is just a really large risk assessment and so if you understand the deal that's being done it's it's um what you're doing is you're interpreting and processing commercial terms and an agreement that people have had and making sure that's reflected in a deal. Some of those boilerplates you might have to adjust for the jurisdictions, but that you know that effectively they're doing the same thing. The process by which you do it doesn't differ. It's the same concept, even if you work in a civil law um, jurisdiction. That's probably done a little bit differently. You know, like in France, they have like moral rights and all of these different things around IP. But generally, it's not that hard to shift in that particular area between those three jurisdictions, yeah. The Melbourne Law Master's Program offers master's degrees, graduate diplomas, specialist certificates and single subjects across 26 specialist legal areas. All areas are led by an expert in the field and many areas are linked with a research centre or institute which are a valuable academic resource for students. The Melbourne Law Master subjects are available as single subject enrolments, either with or without assessment. They are available to both law and non-law graduates. Single subject study is a great way to advance your professional knowledge and career in a specialist legal area. Most of our subjects are taught intensively over five days with assessments submitted online, providing students the flexibility to fit their study around work or other commitments. Madeline, it's been a real pleasure and incredibly interesting to talk to you and to learn more about your experiences and your career and your, what you've accomplished in Los Angeles and in Cambodia and, and out Jamaica and <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, on behalf of all those who've participated in this event, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to you for giving up your time to share your insights and advice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And with that, we'll conclude the webinar.